How many hours have you spent in this world? Just trekking through the land and soaking in the music, the distant mountains, the villagers going about their days, the wildlife, the sky. Or throwing on your combat gear and crushing draugers, shooting down dragons and smashing through bandit camps. How many different builds have you played? The stealthy thief, the unkillable tank, the overpowered mage, the archer assassin who is secretly a family man with four adopted kids waiting for him at home. Zooming out a little to reality, think of all the times you've booted this game up on multiple generations of consoles during different seasons of life. Maybe after your high school band performance, as a break during an all-nighter in college, before the kids wake up in the morning, or at the end of a long day at work. This game is over a decade old, and yet there's a chance you've played it within the last few years. For many of us, it's a staple that never leaves for long. It re-emerges like an evening tide that strikes the shores of our lives and pulls us out to familiar waters. In case that cheesy analogy didn't make it obvious enough, I'll go ahead and say it. Skyrim is my favorite game. I've had a lot of fun playing other games like The Witcher 3, The Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Minecraft, Assassin's Creed, and NBA 2K. But none of these games have ever quite managed to take hold of me like Skyrim, and I need to know why. So I've spent the last two months replaying the game, talking to my friends about it, reading blogs, and watching interviews with the devs to answer this question. After 10 years, why haven't I stopped playing this game? And maybe more importantly, why haven't I been able to enjoy any other games as much as Skyrim? When I asked my friends why they play Skyrim after all these years, many of them talked about the immersion. Between the beautiful landscape, the abundance of conversable NPCs, the random events, hidden quests and locations, NPC schedules, lore books and scrolls, the different guilds to join, and one of the best music scores ever, it's no wonder why. To me, Skyrim feels like a real place that exists long before I open up the game and continues to exist even if I'm not playing at the moment. If you start wandering the world, it won't be long before you stumble across an NPC with some unique dialogue and a miscellaneous task, maybe a letter to deliver. Along the way, some bandits might attack you, and you're suddenly in the fight of your life. Luckily, you're a pro and you take them on like a champ. Maybe a few other random events befall you, but eventually you deliver the letter. The second NPC thanks you, then a dragon attacks. Well, now you have to kill this dragon quickly, or the non-essential NPC you just helped is going to die. <sighs> I guess some things never change. Each of us has countless stories of getting distracted by a side quest, a unique location, or just a really tall mountain we want to get to the top of. Skyrim is meant to pull you in and gives you organic adventures at every turn. I know I'm starting with some of the more obvious parts of this game, but don't worry, we'll dive deeper as we go. We first have to lay a strong foundation, because without these qualities, nothing else in the game would matter. We'll be quick so we can get to the real meat of the video. The sheer size of this game enables players to sink hundreds or even thousands of hours into it. There are 300 plus quests, dozens of playstyles, over 400 named locations, not to mention the hundreds of unnamed places that are still being discovered to this day over 1,000 unique NPCs, 66 different options for a spouse, depending on your taste. One of the best parts of this game is just wandering. It's so fun to explore until you find a new place and delve into whatever secrets the devs left behind. Maybe you'll uncover a quest you've never encountered or an item worth displaying in your house. You just never know, and I love that sense of discovery. Skyrim manages to have a massive amount of things to do while still keeping the quality of these things at a maximum. On my recent playthrough, I heard a noise that's been bothering me for like, years. This extremely annoying ringing, of which I've never been able to find the source. Determined to learn the answer once and for all, I tracked it down to this stupid plant. I almost couldn't believe it when the noise stopped. How had I never found this before? Maybe that was something you uncovered like an hour into your experience. Maybe I'm a scrub for not knowing about this before. The point is, there are countless things to do and explore, and each person's experience is unique because of it. There's always a new path to take, a new playstyle to invent, and a new adventure to seek. After hearing my friends bring up both the breadth of content and the immersive experience, I asked them, couldn't you get that same experience from GTA? The response was, maybe, but this is fantasy. Which is exactly how I would answer the same question. Skyrim is not only a quality open world, but a quality fantasy open world, and that makes all the difference. Sure, I can blow things up in GTA or skydive onto unsuspecting pedestrians, but can I ride a dragon or craft my armor from its bones? Can I join a guild of the land's most fierce assassins? Can I pointlessly push wood through a sawmill? Not everyone who loves Skyrim is a fantasy nerd, but for those of us that are, this game is pure gold. 
Everyone who's played the game knows exactly what I mean by the Skyrim ambience. That perfect combination of music, the skybox, visual effects, and the atmosphere is nothing short of therapeutic. And while this ambience certainly makes me nostalgic, I think it's a disservice to say nostalgia is the only reason or even the main reason so many people come back to Skyrim. But it is an important piece of the picture. Life has a tendency to become more and more complicated. It seems like the level of stress and commitment and responsibility increases pretty steadily until you're retired. So anyone who played Skyrim when it first came out likely played it at a simpler time of their life. It personally reminds me of staying up late in my first college dorm to play it on an Xbox 360 my roommate found outside of a dumpster. For you, maybe it was a friend's house, and you didn't even mind watching him play because it was so entrancing. Maybe it was the first RPG you ever encountered, and you were hooked instantly. Back then you didn't have student loans or bills, so you could just play from the moment you got home until your parents told you to go outside and stop staring at the TV. Skyrim is infused with the memories of our lives before, of simpler times. There's nothing wrong with that, even if some people say that these memories are rose-colored glasses that blot out the flaws of the game. But to them, I ask this question. If nostalgia is the only thing bringing us back to Skyrim, wouldn't we be revisiting all of our games from the past? One thing that sets it apart is that Skyrim has an incredibly diverse game loop that allows for almost endless progression without ever feeling grindy. I've played my share of Assassin's Creed games, and it almost always ends the same. I get the game on sale, the story sucks me in, and I play nonstop for an afternoon or evening. I really enjoy these game worlds, especially Origins and Odyssey, and exploring usually lasts me the next few days. I level up here and there, doing side quests that interest me and diving into every conveniently placed hay bale I can find. Then I return to the main quest for a while. Sometime around this point, there comes a moment where the main quest has a recommended level way higher than my own. It stops me dead in my tracks every time. Suddenly, the game goes from an engaging, plot-driven story with fun gameplay and lots of side content, to a grindy sludge where I'm forced to engage with a bunch of fetch quests before I can return to the part of the game I actually want to play. I might keep at it for a bit, maybe getting a bit farther into the story before slowly fizzling out over the next couple weeks. A month later, and I end up deleting the game to make room for a placid plastic duck simulator. You are a placid plastic duck. The same thing happens with NBA 2K and even Minecraft. Whether it's participating in annoying team drills between games to get badges, or spending countless hours mining cobblestone in survival mode, I always hit a point where the grind surpasses the reward. I'm not saying these games are bad. I enjoy them, and I appreciate them for what they are. But there's no denying that they become repetitive or they restrict your freedom. Often both. Listen to this quote from Joel Burgess, one of the lead level designers for Skyrim. Side content is meaningful because you can miss it. Assassin's Creed has side content that's extremely fun until they force you to engage with it, making it main content you can't miss if you want to finish the game. Skyrim doesn't have this problem. It's not interested in making you pointlessly engage in activities to collect resources or level up. The game scales with your level, meaning you can finish the main quest without ever veering off course or beat it a thousand hours into a build and still have a great experience either way. Some people might argue that dungeons are a grind, but I'd disagree. To me, a grind is engaging in repetitive or obnoxious activity in order to progress in the game. I enjoy combat enough that it never feels like a chore to clear a mine or a tomb. The level design keeps things interesting, especially since I'm the type of player that likes to look into every nook and cranny. I hate it when I reach the end of a dungeon and I know in the back of my mind that there was one path I missed because I thought I was taking the side route first and planned on coming back, but the side route turned out to be the main route and now I'll never find out what was back there. At the end, you almost always get something worthwhile, whether that's a new word to a shout, a best in slot item, or gear you can sell off to a merchant for cash. And best of all, the dungeons have nice exits or loops so you don't ever have to backtrack. Even if you don't enjoy all that, the great thing is, you don't ever have to enter a dungeon if you don't want to. Just explore the cities, the towns, the mountains, the sea, the college, anything you want. The parts of the game that can be considered a grind, like a certain quest to obtain unusual gems, are optional. They often offer decent rewards, and honestly, they're a lot of fun for some people. The point is, thanks to its broad gameplay loop, Skyrim is not the type of game you get burnt out playing. Tired of going through the dwarven mines, collecting cogs to melt down so you can hit max smithing? Go build a sick house and fill it with gear you've collected. Done with quests for a while? Maybe you'd fancy becoming a werewolf. I'm not saying I hate grindy games. I love Minecraft and the reason I play survival mode is because collecting the resources to build something epic makes it all the more rewarding when I finish. Assassin's Creed makes you feel like a demigod when you encounter a low-level boss after returning from a leveling up session, but eventually these games burn their players out. Invariably, I will put the controller away because the game has become more like a job than a relaxing pastime. The only reason I ever stop playing a Skyrim is because I feel like I've done everything I've wanted to. 
for now. Last time I stopped because I completed every major quest line, including the DLCs. This time, I'll probably stop playing when I run out of new locations to discover. Or not. Who knows? Maybe I'll get inspired to lock myself in Whiterun and try to max my skills. Play it like Iron Man mode in RuneScape. Or beat the entire game using only a fork. Probably not, but these are just a few of the countless challenges out there. Skyrim is a game that lets you do whatever you want without forcing you to engage in any one thing. Half of the people I've talked to for this video have sunk hundreds of hours into the game without ever even finishing the main story. That was like the first thing I did. This game lets you do what you want, when you want to, no matter how little or how much time you've already played. So let's do a 180. Skyrim doesn't railroad players into a certain playstyle or into certain regions. However, it does give you a clear path for leveling up your character, advancing the storyline, and exploring the world. As I mentioned before, I've played a lot of achievement or level-driven games, and there's a reason I love them, even if I do get burnt out. Man, when that sweet dopamine hits as your progress bar moves up and the numbers get bigger, I'm like a lab rat with a meth lever. Without these systems in place, games can often feel pointless to me. I've spent a lot of time building things in Minecraft. I've explored hundreds of caves, built dozens of bases, and deep dived into redstone creation mumbo jumbo style. But I usually stop playing after thinking, what's next? Sometimes having your imagination be the limit can be, well, limiting. Skyrim is not going to spoon feed you content, but there's always an obvious way to progress the game. The perk system allows for a wide range of builds. It forces you to make conscious decisions about the type of character you want to play. It gives you something to work toward, and later on down the road when you've settled into a rhythm, the quick dragon kills and dungeon clears feel like the results of careful decision making and not just the game taking it easy on you. Shouts are a great way of adding another layer of magic to all combat types. They can turn the tide of a battle and make you feel like an absolute beast. Not to mention the pure joy of Fusro dying Lydia into oblivion. There are so many shouts out there, and they give you reason to delve into dungeons and to scour the lands for dragons. There's something so refreshing about the sound of capturing a dragon soul and unlocking a shout. Even exploration is part of the progression. Once you get close enough to a named location, it shows up on your map so you can get to it. After you've explored it, you can come back anytime via fast travel. The game keeps track of dungeons you've cleared so you don't have to repeat content. It all works together to give you a sense of accomplishment in the natural course of the game. Quests are simple to follow, so you don't need to pull up a wiki. I'm looking at you, old school RuneScape. And you can easily switch between them or stop paying attention altogether. Something I don't see mentioned often enough is the balance of the quest's interconnectedness. If quests are too interconnected and rely on the completion of prior quests, that severely limits the player's agency. Not to mention that each choice introduced into a quest makes it exponentially more difficult for the devs. Imagine if there were 16 more quests after Civil War finished. That's 16 quests you have to write taking into account the fact that the player could have picked either the Stormcloaks or the Imperials. Now imagine that every four quests, another major choice is introduced, doubling the number of paths and the amount of content needed. By the end of the 16 quests, you have 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 multiplied by the two Civil War endings, which is 32 total endings if my math is correct. As you can see, things quickly get out of hand. Sure, you can weave choices back into a common thread or just have fewer major decisions, but then the player feels like they're having less of an impact. Even if you don't have any choices, creating 16 direct quests limits how many the player has access to. You can't start part 14 without doing the other 13. However, if you split that into four separate quest lines, you now have four options for the player to choose from instead of just doing one after the other. The opposite end of the spectrum is probably worse. From a developmental standpoint, it's simpler to have hundreds of one-off quests that don't have any prerequisites. You can add four endings to every quest without having it trickle down to any others. But this comes at the cost of a potentially disjointed experience where there are no long-term stakes, cohesive storylines, or dynamic characters. Skyrim balances this well by having several long, loosely connected storylines that span multiple entries, locations, and characters. You have the main quest, the Companions, the Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhood, Dawnguard, Dragonborn, the College of Winterhold, the Civil War, the Daedric quests, and more. There are big decisions along the way that will carry weight and affect that particular storyline, but those decisions rarely shut you out from other content since they're usually made near the end. Because of the large number of quest lines, as well as a massive catalog of one-offs, players can find quests anywhere they look, even if they haven't done a ton of prerequisites. All that to say is Skyrim has a remarkably broad and balanced range of quests, which make progression natural and engaging. Marvelous.
The level as you play system the Elder Scrolls games are known for makes every aspect of the game rewarding. An interconnected economy and skilling system give the player clear direction for gear and result in satisfying upgrades, even without exploits that give you a carrying capacity of 585,357. Overall, this game knows how to incentivize its players organically with gratifying rewards, and that sense of accomplishment goes a long way to make the game feel less like an empty world and more like a place of endless possibility. It's kind of crazy how much stuff you can interact with in Skyrim. Most of us already have an inventory full of mostly useless crap by the time we exit Helgen. I mean, who could resist all of that free stuff lying around? It shows you the value right there. I'm definitely going to use all the food and candlesticks and bone meal I'm collecting, right? But seriously, Skyrim lets you pick up, like, everything. Even things that seem decorative can often be cut down or fusrodat away, like this dangling dead skeever. The devs referred to adding all these items as cluttering the world, but I prefer the term populating. It makes the game feel lived in. You can pick plants and take animal hides for crafting gear or brewing potions. And if you're like me and can't be bothered to make a single potion, you can always sell the materials to Bellathor. Because in Skyrim, everything's for sale, my friend. Everything. It's not just the items that provide lots of options to interact, the NPCs are also highly engaging. Sure, some of them spout the same quotes at you every time, but I appreciate that everyone will stop and talk to you. Most of them have multiple dialogue options, and even the ones that don't will at least say something before moving on. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. This may seem trivial to longtime players, especially since we have most of those lines memorized by now, but when you play a game that lacks the same level of integration, it becomes painfully obvious. Take Harry Potter Legacy, for example. A great game in general from what I hear, but a big complaint I hear is that you can't really talk much to other students. It's a jarring experience. Skyrim spoiled us by giving us a vibrant world full of characters that are just living their lives. And I love that. I love talking to an NPC I haven't seen before, especially when I realize they actually have a quest for me. You make sure the lug tips you when he gets it. Sometimes when I play Skyrim, I feel like Simba talking to his dad. Everything the sun touches is a place where I can wander, discover, conquer, and plunder. See a mountain? Climb it. See a castle? Raid it. Prancing deer? Hunt it. Favorite NPC? Marry them. Shipwreck? Swim there. Nothing is for show. It's all there for you to explore, loot, and engage with. Speaking of choices, character creation is one of my favorite aspects of an RPG, and I instantly miss it in games like Red Dead Redemption 2, Kingdom Come Deliverance, and The Witcher 3. I get why they have you play through a specific character, but for me, I'll always pick customizing my guy if given the option. I've probably spent more time in the Skyrim character creator than half the games in my Xbox library. There are endless options, and each one gives you a unique feel starting the game. This brute of an orc plays differently than my Dark Elf build, even though they're very similar technically, aside from a few starting stats, a perk, and a power. Skyrim lets you do more than just create disgusting looking characters. You can build giant houses with rooms for alchemy, enchanting, storage, and more. There are countless pieces of armor and clothing to mix and match. I mean, how sick do I look? You can adopt kids and turn stray dogs, hungry skeevers, spiders, and foxes into companions. You can get married and have your spouse run a business for you. You can buy different horses, turn yourself into a vampire, turn yourself into a werewolf, and so much more. All these small decisions and options lead to a character that feels fully fleshed out and really yours. No one else has made all these exact customizations you have. The difference between a massive, empty world and a vibrant, open world is the ability to interact. It doesn't matter how ambient and beautiful the mountains and forests and plains are if you can't engage in any meaningful way. In a word, Skyrim gives you total freedom. It's one of the many qualities that bring us back to the game over and over again. By the way, thanks for watching this video. My channel is still new, so your support means a lot. I make videos about movies, shows, books, and video games. If you'd like to see more from me, you're more than welcome to subscribe or even turn on the notification bell. Whatever you decide to do, I really appreciate your time. Now let's get back to the video. There are some great game franchises out there, but I don't think any can match the lore of the Elder Scrolls games. Skyrim is the fifth installment in this series, and at this point, the rich in-game history is built into the DNA of these games. I don't think I can overstate how deep this goes. If you have a free 25 hours, Fudge Muppet has over 100 videos diving into specific topics of the lore. Imperial Knowledge has a bunch of great videos as well, including some for beginners if you're interested in learning more. It makes sense that these channels thrive when you look at the source material. With over 10 official games, multiple game guides, dozens of in-game books, countless developer interviews, and two novels, there's plenty of material to sift through. I'm no lore buff, but I know there's a massive community of people who love diving into this world, not unlike the Middle Earth or Wheel of Time communities. So if you want to discuss the details of how individuals who have achieved Kim are able to become Amaranth and create their own dream reality, you'll have plenty of people who are more than willing on Reddit. 
Even if you don't care all that much about the history of Tamriel prior to Skyrim, the lore still enhances your gameplay. The region of Skyrim itself was conceived all the way back at the start of the first game, Elder Scrolls Arena. The whole Nordic vibe is a result of this lore. Alduin and his apocalyptic return is mentioned in Morrowind, so we can thank that tidbit for the main plot of the game. The different races are a result of an evolving, larger storyline. They look and talk and act differently because of these origins. For example, the orcs are scattered throughout Skyrim in strongholds, but they don't have any cities here or in other regions and haven't managed to conquer significant land because, in short, their entire race is the result of a curse. Their violent nature often provoked the other races to band together against them to suppress their growth. Some of the game's best quest lines and content are iterations on the previous games. The Thieves' Guild has appeared in every game since Daggerfall. Their Dark Brotherhood has been around since the start, though you couldn't join them until later on in the series. Morrowind introduced the ability to join the Blades. Daedric quests? We've had those since Daggerfall. Heck, even sweet rolls have been in the game since Arena. Let me guess. Someone stole your sweet roll. That distinctly free feeling in Skyrim is something every Elder Scrolls game has worked to increase. In fact, every mechanic in this game is the result of iterating on the genre for well over a decade. Sure, not every game gets better in every aspect, but there's no denying that Skyrim is the result of a studio with strong ARPG DNA working year after year to make great games. The experience of the studio, the vast lore, and the successful iterations of its predecessors all make Skyrim immeasurably better. I can't imagine a new studio or even an experienced studio making a new franchise, creating something as intricate, deep, and whole as Skyrim. In my opinion, mods get too much credit for Skyrim's success. I have played hundreds of hours on the PC, Xbox 360, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X vanilla versions, and I never felt like the game was missing anything. Mods help the game stay fresh and can really enhance the player's experience, but they aren't by any means a necessity. If you are into that sort of thing, Bethesda has done a good job of making sure that mods are easy to access, even on consoles. A lot of them add better lighting, more customization options, texture variations, improved animations, a better UI, and other visual changes. Or audio changes. My personal favorite is the Project Pew mod. For new players, cosmetic changes might be important, but what really interests me are mods that add quest lines or gameplay options. Ever wondered what it would be like to start Skyrim as something other than a prisoner? Alternate Start lets you pick from a bunch of different options to begin your game, like being a hunter or getting attacked and left for dead. If you want an in-depth quest where you escort a caravan of Khajiit back to their homeland, give Moonpath to Elsewhere a shot. You can add weapons and armor with dozens of different mods or rebuild Helgen with the fully voiced Helgen Reborn mod. There are countless mods that add hundreds of hours of brand new content to the game. If you're worried about the quality of this content, just look at the Forgotten City mod. It won awards for its writing and eventually got turned into its own indie game. If that doesn't speak to the quality of many of these mods, I'm not sure what will. There are a ton of channels and blogs that dive really deep into mods, but I'm not going to get into it here. I do think it was worth mentioning. The vibrant modding community has really helped this game, and many mods add that extra little cherry on top. Blackreach, the headless horsemen, ants crawling along tree stumps, and little critters like butterflies. What do these all have in common? There are additions to Skyrim that weren't in the original schedule, created by passionate devs who just wanted to give the game a little extra life. According to Joel Burgess, who we heard from earlier, less than 100 people worked on Skyrim. For perspective, roughly 500 people worked on Cyberpunk, and Breath of the Wild had around 300 people at its peak. It's clear from interviews that the Elder Scrolls V devs loved what they did and who they got to do it with. They genuinely cared about this project, competed to make each other better, gave it their all, and took it upon themselves to make the experience as immersive as possible for every player. It was never about like what I drew or what I modeled or what I added. It was always about like, what can we give to the player? What can we do collectively to just make this better than it was going to be with each one of our additional steps on there? The ants? You can thank Mark Tier for that. No one asked him to do it. And when he pitched it in a meeting after already having completed the work, the reception was meh. But listen to how he describes his thought process. You have like a very, very interested and participatory audience and they'll find your thing that you love and you put in and they'll make something of it and enjoy it. This is just, you know, tickling an itch for me, but I bet you someone else will like this. Jonah Loeb, a character artist who just wanted the world to feel alive and full of promise, pushed the idea of a critter system. Her critter system pushed the idea of a critter system until developer Sean Simonot, I know I said that wrong, but I promise I practiced first, until he decided to create it as a side project. It's because of these two taking initiative that the game has fireflies and butterflies and moths and other little critters that help our subconscious connect to the game. And what about Blackreach, a whole area of the world, a fan favorite area at that, wouldn't exist without Nate Perkupile and Joe Burgess, quote, sneaking it in. I mean, a lot of people know about it now, but we did effectively sneak it in. 
Then there's my personal favorite, the Headless Horseman. Justin Schramm created a character who spawns randomly in the world and then rides at full speed to Hambeer's Rest, his gravesite. I love seeing the smile on this guy's face as he describes his creation. It's a simple little dumb thing, but I'm so proud of it. There are so many little pieces of the game added in by countless passionate developers. The eventual cumulative effect of everyone who worked on this game giving it their best effort to add just a little extra to the game is one that feels whole, lived in, beautiful even. One of my favorite things on YouTube is a 10 hour long Skyrim ambience video that I throw on in the background while I'm at work. It makes the day better to have that music going, to see the calming Skyrim night sky shining at me while I write code. Every so often, I'll scroll through the comments. You have people who are homesick for a place they've never been, people like me who have never really found a game to match this, and others who just miss simpler times. As I mentioned before, life is much more complicated now for just about everyone than it was 10 years ago. It's challenging to deal with bills and car maintenance fees and debt and aging parents and health problems and financial downturn, and all of these factors make it harder to find time to relax. Sometimes when we do have time, it's a challenge to just let go. For years, Skyrim has been the perfect way for me to do exactly that. I come in knowing that I'm going to enter a fantasy world where I can do anything and be anyone. Usually that anyone is just a guy wandering the tundra, looking at the sky and trees, stumbling across little shacks or small quests to help NPCs. It's a place where I can unwind, where I bring no expectations except that it's going to be fun, and that the game will bring something new and exciting if only I give it a little time. If you go to the same place over and over to relax, and you find the calmness, or the adventure, or excitement, or exploration you're looking for, it becomes easier and easier to find, because you've already gone down that neural pathway dozens of times before. With limitless freedom, the unending content, rich lore, countless quality mods, and a thoughtfully crafted world, things stay fresh for years. If the game starts to feel stale, you can just start over again with a new build. Or as comes to worse, you can give it a break for a few months, or years, but you'll be back. Because when we play this game, we enter a certain state of mind, one of expectation, filled with memories, knowing that this game, all these years later, still has more to offer. To answer my earlier question, I haven't been able to find another game I enjoy as much as Skyrim because it's a one-of-a-kind game that perfectly aligns with my preferences. You could argue that Red Dead Redemption 2 and The Witcher 3 do some of the things I mentioned in this video even better than Skyrim, but I'll never like those games as much because of my personal taste. All of Skyrim's mechanics and lore and world and stories combine to make a game that is objectively good that I subjectively think is the greatest game of all time. If you're still watching, this probably resonates with you. Luckily for us, the game isn't going anywhere, and we can always hope that we'll still be alive in 2088 when The Elder Scrolls VI comes out. Until then, I'll just be here, playing Skyrim. You, you're finally awake. You were trying to cross the border, right? Walked right into that Imperial ambush, same as us.